In a distant galaxy, humanity has fled their home to occupy a nearby globular cluster, NSC-8412, known as the Forge. It has been 200 years since this exodus, and humanity has discovered that they are the only intelligent species in the cluster, but they are not alone. They struggle in a brutish new existence, maintaining old equipment, fending off hostile alien life, and uncovering remnants of a powerful precursor species thought to be long gone. Those with starships make their way between stars using Eidolon drives, a sporadic means of faster-than-light travel that relegates them to perpetual exploration and wandering. These stellar explorers seek above all else to survive, but also to fulfill vows made on sacred iron. Their vows are the foundation of their daily existence and the fulcrum upon which they live and die. They will traverse countless sectors and settlements to fulfill these vows, for they are the Iron Sworn, and you are one of them. Iron Sworn Starforged was published in 2022 after a very successful Kickstarter, and can fairly be called Iron Sworn in Space. I covered Iron Sworn in a previous video, but in a nutshell, that game was very well received because it presented a clean, structured format for solo and GM-less, or co-op play. The mechanics and presentation of this game are very similar, but the author has really expanded on the moves and the world building tools here. The full title of this game is Iron Sworn Starforge, but I'm just going to call it Starforge. Both games are written by Sean Tomkin, and Starforge also includes art primarily by Joshua Meehan, as well as Nathan Gray, Sarah Dollinger, and Jeff Zugali. I backed this game on Kickstarter and went for the full deal that includes a spiral reference guide and deck of assets cards. But in this video, I'm mostly just going to cover the core rulebook in PDF. The game is built on the principles of the Powered by the Apocalypse paradigm, wherein characters take actions that sometimes trigger moves, and those moves are where dice rolls come into play. Except in this game, the players themselves have moves outside of their character, and there are moves for it seems like everything. It's a moves fest unlike anything I've ever seen actually. By my count, there are 52 moves, which is a lot. Anyway, I'm gonna run through the rulebook here with you and we'll get to the move section in a bit. Like I mentioned, Starforged is built on Iron Sworn, whose claim to fame is the co-op and solo modes of play. You can also play this game in a more traditional format of GM and players, and that's referred to as the guided mode. I found it interesting that the author states at the bottom here in the black text box that one to three players is ideal in guided play. So even in a traditional game mode, this game really focuses on smaller groups. The game gives you a setting, but only in the broad strokes. What you're told is that you're in a human-centric galaxy, having fled from the main galaxy to a smaller cluster of stars 1700 light years away. This cluster, known as the Forge, is a hostile cosmic environment full of stellar storms and hot nebula and unpredictable gravitational currents. There are essentially four regions of the Forge. Terminus, where most of humanity now resides. The Outlands, where settlements are more scattered. The Expanse, where only the bravest settlers and explorers venture, and the Void, where mere travel and survival is a serious challenge. When you're actually prepping for a campaign, the book offers some more detailed options regarding what brought humanity here and what they're facing, but generally, there are no other intelligent species, and most technology is worn down over the centuries rather than newly manufactured. Just like in Iron Sworn, your character is part of a culture that places a lot of stock on personal vows particularly ones made on iron. Your character is essentially composed of their vows, large and small, their five core stats, edge, heart, iron, shadow, and wits, and their assets, which include not just starships, but personal life paths, companions, and powers. The assumption is that your character is driven, lives on the move out in space, is competent and self-reliant, makes mistakes, and is likely human. It's not hard at all to make your character an advanced sort of android in this game, but to make them an alien would be kind of a stretch. You end up rolling the dice in three different kinds of situations in this game. Either an action roll to resolve an action in the fiction, a progress roll to resolve your progress towards a vow or connection with another character, or an oracle roll to create new details in the fiction. I mentioned there were a lot of moves in this game, and the book says here at the top that not everything is a move but I'll show you in a minute how it really feels like most things are a move. Now, as far as the mechanics of the dice rolls in the game, they're identical to Iron Sworn. With an action roll, your most common kind of roll, you're going to be rolling a d6 and 2d10. The d6 is your action die, and you add any relevant stats to that roll, as well as modifiers that come from assets and other things. 
This total is your action score for the roll, and it can never go over 10. You take that action score and compare it against your two D10 rolls, your challenge dice. If your action score is above both challenge dice rolls, you've scored a strong hit for the action. If your action score only beats one of the challenge dice, the roll is considered a weak hit. And if your action score is equal to or below both D10s, it's a miss. Anytime your two challenge dice come up as a match, depending on if you rolled a hit or a miss, something special happens. Certain moves and assets specify certain things that happen on a match, but otherwise you just embellish whatever result that occurs in the fiction, if it makes sense. Momentum is a constantly changing point pool that you can use to replace an action score on a given roll. Many, if not most moves in the game affect your momentum. It's a common currency in the game that is meant to represent your narrative luck or fortune. I've mentioned it in my Ironsworn video, but I still think that placing the track at the edge of the character sheet and using a paper clip that slides up and down to track the points is brilliant. Anyway, your momentum is constantly resetting itself after being used, but if your character suffers from impacts, basically negative conditions, then your reset position and momentum maximum are temporarily reduced. There are four things that you track the progression of. Some are very short term, like a fight or brawl. Some are medium term, like a session long side mission. And some are long term, like your background vow or a connection you have with an NPC. Anytime you make headway on one of these progression tracks, you mark a tick, but depending on the difficulty assigned to the track, the tick can take either up to three whole boxes out of 10, two boxes, one box, half a box, or a quarter of a box, which is to say, it can take about three milestones to fill a track completely if the, in the case of a troublesome quest, five milestones for a dangerous quest, 10 milestones for a formidable quest, 20 for an extreme quest, and 40 ticks for an epic quest. But you can cash in and attempt to finish a quest no matter how many ticks you have on a progression track. You do this by first describing it in the fiction and then making a progress roll. With a progress roll, instead of rolling a D6 action die, you take the number of filled boxes on your progress track. That's your action score basically, although it's called a progress score in this case. And then you roll the 2D10 challenge dice. The comparison is otherwise the same. You either beat both, beat one, or beat neither, and interpret that for the fiction. The way to level up in this game is by completing these more specific quests over and over, and as you do so, earn ticks on three separate special legacy tracks. These legacy tracks are a more abstract representation of your overall progress. And for every box you fill on any of these tr three tracks, you gain two experience points that you can spend. The experience points are actually shown as those two little boxes on the bottom of each legacy track box. When you get around to spending experience points on either upgrading assets or getting new assets, you just fill in the box with a mark to show that it's been spent. On the right side of your character sheet, also cleverly tracked with paper clips, are your health, spirit, and supply, which each generally track your physical condition, mental condition, and your level of material preparedness, respectively. These will go up and down through various moves, and when you hit zero on any of them, you can pick up so-called impacts. Impacts include misfortunes, vehicle troubles, burdens, and lasting effects. There is a move associated with each of these impacts. Assets are a foundational aspect of the game. They come exclusively in the form of cards, either physical or ones that you can print at home, so you need to be prepared to deal with that. At the time of this recording, there is no first or usable third-party list of all Starforge assets in normal text on page format. Fortunately, once you commit to printing the 10 or so pages and cutting them out, it's pretty fun to sort them into your categories and parse out what your character has and doesn't have. Anyway, there are six types of assets in the game. The command vehicle, basically your starship that you and your friends fly around in, modules for your vehicles, paths, which define your character's background, interest, skills, training, and key equipment, companions, which are NPC helpers that are loyal to you, and deeds, which you can only get after filling up your bonds legacy track a bit. Every single asset in this game has three abilities to it. When you acquire the asset, you get the first level for free. To unlock either of the other two abilities, you need to spend two experience points, but you can unlock those abilities in either order. Buying a new asset, by the way, costs three experience. The book explains in detail how to set up a game, and this really is a necessary step. You can't actually jump right into a game of Starforged because some of the setting is not built yet. You have to complete the backdrop. But as the book rightly says, prep is play. 
the minute you start mapping out your version of the setting, you're actually playing the game and hopefully enjoying yourself. The default assumptions of the setting are here on the right. I guess the closest that this gets is to the alien universe. Humans are alone, they're out in space a lot. Space is hostile, humans are hostile. The technology is retrofuturistic. But you're expected to fine tune all this a bit by answering 14 truths. The truths cover the nature of humanity's, the truths cover the nature of humanity's current organizational structure in the forge, the reason for their exodus from the main galaxy, and the existence or non-existence of magic, religion, space monsters, precursors, as well as the level of technology. Each of these 14 truths that you have to answer come with three options, which are always organized along a spectrum of minimum, medium, and maximum, depending on the question. In my co-op play through this game, each of us took turns rolling a truth and we collaboratively came up with a very cohesive setting. And it's true, prep is play. Uh, this stage of the game is a lot of fun. It's interesting because the game does meet you halfway in terms of providing a setting, but when you consider all of the final options that you're given, you can tilt your setting in a ton of different directions, provided it's not stuffed full of aliens or giant starships. Character creation is listed out as 11 steps, but I'll just cover the single most important step in this video, and that's your background vow. This vow is supposed to represent a foundational motivation of your character, and it's integrated into your character's background. You make iron vows throughout the course of gameplay, but this one has already been made at the start of play. When playing solo, this can be pretty much anything, but if you're playing with other people, it's probably best to get your background vows to intersect somehow, so that you're not all chasing after completely different things. There's a worksheet here you can use to build out a starting sector. In this context, a sector is an explored area of space that contains maybe half a dozen or a dozen locations of interest. You don't necessarily need to map out a whole sector before starting play, but it could help with the flow of the game at first so that you don't have to stop and create locations during a session. Even if you do create a sector though, you still don't necessarily want to fill out all the details of every settlement at the start. The book suggests just painting with broad strokes here and fleshing it out as you go. There is also a connections worksheet. Okay, time out. One thing you should know is that if you are playing Starforged with the digital version, there are several documents at play and I'll just save you some time and tell you where everything is. If you want the full rules, game explanation and all the tables, use the core rulebook. If you want a summary of the rules, use the rules reference. But if you want to actually print out a character sheet and these worksheets, you need to download the play kit, a short PDF that has these sheets. And the only way to get the assets cards is to download the asset cards PDF. It's all included when you buy the Starforge digital version, but just be prepared to juggle a few different PDFs to get everything together for a game. Okay, anyway, you have a connections worksheet where you can keep track of NPCs who you have an important relationship with. Your path with a connection may only occasionally intersect, and there's a special move called make a connection anytime you want to try and create a new one in your story. Just like in Iron Sworn, you've got a lot of moves to choose from, and they're broken down into a number of different categories. But in the case of Starforged, you're getting almost twice the number of moves. The first set are the session moves, which have safety tools like set a flag, change your fate, and take a break. At first I was confused about why these are considered moves, but I figure once you start making everything a move, then everything might as well be a move, including taking a break to use the bathroom or whatever. But to be fair, take a break doesn't actually mention a bathroom, and it actually gives you a plus one to your next action roll, which is pretty nice. I can't go through an analysis of all of these moves, but take a look at the list of six adventure moves right here. You can see the granularity of gameplay, where despite not everything needing to be a move, most of what your character might do could be construed of as triggering a move. And these moves are not always that simple either. There's a lot of detail included in many of them, and they often lead to other moves. It's not to say that this is bad. If anything, the sheer amount of detail for each of these moves means that a lot of thought and playtesting has been put into crafting them. But it does mean that on your first playthrough of this game, there's going to be a lot of stop and go. Or in the alternative, you can play the game without worrying too much about remembering all the moves. But in the case of guided play, where the GM is expected to facilitate the rules of the game, they have a pretty heavy burden to shoulder if all the players are new and haven't really read the dozens of moves. Not all moves come into play all the time. For example, the exploration moves are only going to be invoked when you're traveling in a spaceship. 
undertake an expedition has probably the meatiest explanation of any move I've seen in any PBTA game ever. It's triggered when you quote, trailblaze a route through perilous space, journey over hazardous terrain, or survey a mysterious site. It's unpacked across four pages, and it's just one of those moves you want to understand if you intend on playing Starforge the way it was envisioned. Combat is detailed with eight different moves, but just like in Ironsworn, one of the moves is battle, with which you can sidestep all the details of combat with just a single roll. There is no stone unturned with the combat mechanics of this game, even though it has a narrative-driven PBTA framework. Well, I take that back. There is one big stone sort of left unturned, maybe to be covered in a later game supplement if fans really want it, and that's ship-to-ship -ship combat. In this book, you get a list of possible battle stations to consider, but no move structure or guidance on how to implement them. Here you have six moves for taking different types of damage. And I may not have shown you this, but some of these moves have their own tables, such as Endure Harm. This is why the game comes with a separate reference book, because you're not likely to memorize some of these longer moves, let alone the tables embedded in some of them. Endure Harm happens to be one of the more commonly used moves in gameplay, so you'd need to reference this one with some frequency. One other thing I didn't mention is that your vehicles can take damage, and your command ship can take so much damage that it becomes permanently cursed. That is tracked on the asset card itself, but generally, when your vehicle takes damage, you refer to this move right here on the left. Ask the Oracle and Pay the Price are the ones you'll be using constantly. The Oracle move is a pretty elegant and concise way of asking a question and getting an answer without a GM or guide. This move, in combination with the dozens of Oracle tables at the end of the book, are really what make Starforge playable in solo and co-op mode. Pay the price comes up constantly because it's always being suggested by other moves when you roll a fail. Of course, it's closely associated with the Ask the Oracle move because really you're just looking for any creative way to describe a failure. There's a pretty great chapter covering everything you need to know about NPCs. All NPCs are reduced to a single rank, which itself can be interpreted in at least six different ways listed here. The connection between the rank of an NPC and the game's mechanics are a bit fuzzy, but honestly the game has enough complication as it is. It doesn't need some elaborate NPC stat system. The list of sample NPCs here on the left gives you some starting points for your own sci-fi monsters, machines, and bad guys. I always make the same gripe in every review it seems, but I have to repeat it here. I wish that every one of these NPCs had an illustration, considering the quality of Joshua Meehan's work. There's nothing like a hyper-realistic image to spark one's imagination, after all. As far as the actual oracles tables in this game, they make up about 100 out of the 400 pages of this book. They are extensive, to the point of making Starforged a book whose value goes beyond the game itself. In other words, if you won't play Starforged, you probably still want to get Starforged for the Oracle tables. That is, if you need spacefaring RPG ideas for your own game. The book doesn't advise that you roll on all of the tables of the Oracle in one go, but if you actually did, you would pretty much create a fleshed out sector of space full of adventure seeds and pretty well realized locations. I can't even show you the half of it in this video, but this chapter is packed with more of Mian's artwork and really evokes a sense of dark and dangerous sci-fi exploration. All right, here are my thoughts on Starforged. Moves Fest. I've mentioned it ad nauseum in this video, but I feel like the number of moves creates a fairly tall barrier for entry for new players. Rather than just leave it at that, I wanted to give the author, Sean Tompkin, a chance to provide a response or retort to this criticism. And his response was the same as when I asked him about Ironsworn's many moves. For both Ironsworn and Starforged, he says that one, for solo and GMless play, the number of moves helps to create interesting hooks into gameplay, such as resource management and the two health tracks, making it more than a purely narrative exercise. Two, Sean says that once a player becomes more familiar with the moves, translation from character intent to move starts to become second nature. And the names of the moves are quite literal and not hidden behind any figurative or poetic turns of phrase or anything like that. And three, the moves are organized by category and have an intuitive structure. As far as the even more number of moves in Starforged, he tweeted, quote, the moves is an inherent part of play. It's a big part of the conversation of the game, particularly for solo and co-op, and the number of moves means that conversation is richer and more varied and creates more opportunities and choices. 
but that also means it's not to everyone's taste, which is of course expected and fine. Comparing to Ironsworn, there are additional moves to incorporate session framing and safety tools and to manage new pillars of play, exploration and bonds. As with Ironsworn, moves are structured by activity and often explicitly feed into each other. PDF juggle. It took me a bit of research to figure out where everything was in order to start playing. Just as a reminder, your asset cards can only be found in card form in the card PDFs and your character and worksheets are found in the play kit PDF, not the core rule book and not the reference book. Right amount of setting. I thought it was nice how the author did define a sci-fi setting for you, but stopped at about mid stroke and handed you the reins. I think if he hadn't defined as much, the game might've felt a little too mushy in terms of setting. And I'll admit, I kind of like settings with fewer sentient alien races running around or next to none as the case may be in this game. Artwork and layout. I think a lot of people were impressed with the clean layout and organization that Sean did with Ironsworn, and he's come back with a vengeance in this game. The sharp orderly presentation is the same, but with the hyper-realized artwork by Joshua Meehan and the icons by Nathan Gray, the whole package comes together in a really cohesive way. The oracles. Like I mentioned, I think the oracles in this game, which make up 25% of the core rulebook, are worth the price of admission. Most PBTA games choose a theme and focus very tightly on it, and they do so with a curated list of moves that direct the players to play a certain way. Starforged has a theme, but as far as direction of gameplay, it's hard to identify. Considering how many moves are in play, you aren't really being nudged to play in a certain way. You are certainly given things that you're meant to accomplish, namely your iron vowels, but how you accomplish them is entirely up to you. Anyways, that's all I got. Thanks for watching. See ya.